Ozma is honored to welcome back a very special guest joining us from Washington, D.C., the Honorable Chairman Robert L. Summer of the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. We'll take just a minute to put up uh, the bio here, make sure everything's ready. Please stand by. And Chairman Summel of the NTSB, the floor is all yours when you're ready, sir. Anthony Lamb, thank you for introducing me. And I'd like to thank Dr. Siri, Dr. Wee Kong Sung, and Captain Chester Vu. Uh, it is a wonderful honor to be able to be with you this morning. And uh, thank you very much. I want to talk about professionalism and safety culture. They are two issues that are very important to me. Uh, but let me say that the uh, I was in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, in uh, 1993 for the Flight Safety Foundation meeting that was hosted by Malaysia Airlines. It was uh, held at the Shangri-La Hotel. And uh, I remember looking out on the skyline and seeing all of the cranes, the construction cranes, because massive construction was going on in Kuala Lumpur. So I know it's changed a lot in the 27 years since I've been there. Good morning and thank you again. Um, I, my background is I started uh, uh, in general aviation and uh, flight instructing. And then uh, while I was still in college, I got hired by an organization to fly their business aircraft that they bought brand new. And for a 22 year old uh, flying a brand new Piper, Piper Navajo in 1979 was a lot of fun and a great job for a youngster. Uh, I spent about 23 or 24 years uh, as an airline pilot. And then I went back to business aviation. So I certainly understand the, the advantages and the benefits of business aviation. That's where I cut my teeth. That's really the beginning of my flying and then the end of my flying. And then in 2006, I left business aviation to join the National Transportation Safety Board. So I want to talk to you just a moment about the federal, about the uh, NTSB. We are uh, an independent federal agency charged by Congress to investigate transportation accidents to determine the probable cause and issue safety recommendations to prevent those accidents from happening again. We are similar to the Malaysia Air Accident Investigation Bureau, except for we investigate all modes of transportation. Here's an aviation accident that, we're just, that we've just uh, completed the investigation of, a B-17 bomber that crashed a few years ago, but we also investigate selected rail accidents, selected Let's see, where is it? Come on. Selected uh, highway crashes, selected maritime accidents, and even pipeline accidents, because of course we transport. Pipeline is a mode of transportation for valuable commodities such as oil that you might otherwise put on a truck or in a train. So we, we investigate all modes of transportation. The board is made up of five uh, presidential appointees were appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the United States Senate. Our role is really to provide the, the oversight over the staff's products. We have a wonderful staff that are experts in various fields. So that's what we do. But today, as I mentioned, I want to talk to you about two things, professionalism and safety culture. This is a standby attitude indicator from a Cessna citation that crashed a number of years ago. It crashed in that attitude. So I ask, as it relates to professionalism, are you maintaining the right attitude? This is another one. This was a regional jet uh, on a ferry flight uh, a few years ago. 
and the pilots uh, were just the two of them on board, and they thought that they would take the airplane up to 41,000 feet to see how it would, would perform, but unfortunately they allowed the airplane to stall. Um, it had an, an, um, an upset that it basically fell from 41,000 down to about 35,000 feet before they recovered, the, uh, got the airplane under control again, but unfortunately both engines had, had quit and were damaged so severely from the compressor stalls. And they, they um, were unable to get the engine started because they were actually damaged. And what the NTSB commented on, we said the pilot's unprofessional behavior, their deviation from standard operating procedures and poor airmanship, which resulted in an in-flight emergency from which they were unable to recover the pilot's unprofessional behavior. And that's really what we're talking about. I want to switch for a moment and talk about what appears to be a, a very impressive operation. This was a, a, a an organization. It was a, an airplane owned by a very wealthy individual. He uh, employed a full-time crew. I think the the chief pilot had been in the organization, had been there for 27 or 28 years. The first officer had been there for 11 or 12 years, and the flight attendant had been with the organization for 16 years. So I think that tells you a lot right there, that it must be a very impressive organization, because as you know, in business aviation, people tend to move around a lot. But the fact that the chief pilot had been there for nearly 30 years, the first officer for over 10 years, and the flight attendant for 16, that tells me something right there. They had what was described as an impeccable maintenance. They had very high training standards. They, they, they paid a lot of money for their training for a leading training provider. They went above the minimum standards and they had very good positive audit comments. There was a positive audit comments from their last uh, audit from ISBEO, the International Standard for Business Aircraft Operations. Uh, they, um, uh, it's a, it's a, a, cert a certification standard, if you will. When the auditor was there two years ago, he said the SMS, the safety management system of this operator is well-developed. Best practices are constantly, consistently employed in all facets of the program. Continuous SMS, uh, improvement is actively pursued. The flight operations manual, it is remarkably well written and comprehensive. The safety culture when the, with, within the department is shared among all team members. Um, the open reporting of hazards is consistently encouraged by management. It's a solid safety program, which is maturing nicely. So this is what the auditor found two years ago. And this, so let's see. But unfortunately, this is how that crew and that airplane ended up claiming seven lives in 2014. It ran off the end of the runway and crashed and spanned this small river and burned up. Everybody on the airplane perished. So what did we find? What we did find is that the, the, the crew did not release the gust lock before attempting to fly. And we know that's not a good situation. And we also know that the throttle should not be able to be advanced beyond, a, as you know, the throttles would tend to be locked, so you can't push them up very far uh, if the gust lock is still on. But we found problems with that. that The gust lock, the interface between the throttles and the gust lock system did not meet the certification standard. So they were able to push the power up a lot further than anyone expected. They did not, apparently did not do a flight control check because otherwise they would have determined that the gust lock was still engaged. 
we heard none of the five manufacturer specified checklist, which were, they were not verbalized on the accident flight. But not only did we find that, but we found that no flight, complete flight control check was, was conducted for 173 out of the past 175 flights. Imagine that, 173 flights. They did not conduct a complete flight control check. Now, I may have, somewhere along the line, forgotten to do a flight control check, but if I did, it was certainly not intentional. I would say if you're failing to do something 175 times or 173 times, it's not an inadvertent or they, they just happen to forget it. So I'm going to show you the video. Uh, this is just an animation, I should say. So they uh, engage the autothrottles. The autothrottles push them up to the stop, the stop of where the gust lock interface was keeping them from, from going. You'll notice that they did get about oh, 1.4 or 1.5 EPR. I think the target EPR was 1.7 on this. They're going down the runway. They noticed that they couldn't get something going. Uh, they reach V1. Here's when they attempt to rotate. One of the pilots says, still lock on. And he says it, let's see how many times. One, two, three, four, five, six times. Six times. The steel lock is on, steel lock is on, steel lock is on. Now they've only used up a thousand meters of runway at this point. It's a 2,400 meter, I'm sorry, it's about a 2,200 meter runway, about 7,000 foot long runway. So they had plenty of distance that they could have performed a rejected takeoff at this point. But instead of doing that, they're wasting valuable runway trying to pull the the flight power shutoff valve, um, the FPSOV. There was an old trick that if your gust lock was on, if it had hydraulics, uh, you could not release the gust lock. Um, uh, but, but if you cut off the hydraulic valve, cut off the hydraulic shutoff valve, then you could sometimes release the gust lock. So they're going down the runway. They're attempting to pull this instead of rejecting the takeoff. When they get to this point, they finally apply the brakes and don't hit reversers until they're well into the uh, overrun. Let's watch this quick uh, animation. As the airplane taxied onto the runway, the flight crew discussed the blue rudder limit advisory message consistent with the gust lock still engaged. After the brakes were released, the throttles were advanced manually until they reached a restriction which corresponded to an engine pressure ratio of about 1.4. The auto throttles were engaged. The second in command called out that the airplane had reached a speed of 80 knots. The second in command stated the airplane had reached takeoff decision speed, V1. One of the pilots activated the flight power shutoff valve, likely in an attempt to release the gust lock. Brake pressure started to rise. The thrust reversers were deployed. The airplane collided with runway lighting and a localizer antenna and passed through the airport's perimeter fence before coming to rest in a ravine formed by the Shawsheen River. The main wreckage came to rest about 850 feet past the end of the paved runway overrun and was destroyed by a post-crash fire. So the question, the, the NTSB, the five of us, voted on this when it came to us. And we determined that the probable cause of the crash was the flight crew member's failure to perform the flight control check before takeoff. Their attempt to take off with the gust lock system engaged and their delayed execution of a rejected takeoff after they became aware that the controls were locked. 
and contributing to the accident or the flight crew's habitual non-compliance with the checklist. Habitually not complying with the checklist. And also the a gust lock slash throttle interlock system that did not meet certification standards. And Tom Huff from Gulfstream will be here later this morning. And uh, I think Tom will may well talk about this crash. And Tom, I want you to see, I've got the G650 model right over here that I bought when I came and visited you at Gulfstream a few years ago. Now, the big question is, why would an experienced flight crew perform this way? Again, they had a good record. The captain, the pilot, I'm sorry, the chief pilot was known to be a very sharp person. He attended safety conferences. Why would he perform this way? And our accident report said that when flight crew members perform a routine check repeatedly over a long period of time and never encounters an example of its effectiveness as a safety protection, they may experience a decreased perception of the check's importance. In other words, you get so used to doing a check. When was the last time that you did a flight control check and you found a problem? Perhaps never. And so you do this check over and over and over, and you don't see that any problem ever, or, or, that you ever detect a problem. So then you effectively experience a decreased perception of the check's importance. And so the rest of the report in this section says, as a result, they may begin to skip the check and reallocate their efforts towards other goals that they regard as more important. And such change can lead to the development of new group norms about what is expected and an increasing mismatch between the written guidance and the actual operating practice. And this increasing mismatch has been described as procedural drift. Procedural drift. Now, I know these slides will be posted on the, uh, this presentation will be posted on the ASPA website, and I will also post these slides on the NTSB's website. You know, another term that I would say, instead of just saying procedural drift, I would say another term is complacency, where we become smug, we, we forget the importance of a danger that is lurking right there. And so I think complacency has something to do with it. And so I'm going to ask you, when we go into the cockpit voice recorder lab at the NTSB, how does it sound when people are joking and laughing? Well, I'll tell you how it sounds. Now, I realize that we don't always want to be uptight when we're flying. We want to be relaxed. We want to be professional. We want to follow the book. We, but there's a line there where you can take it too far and be too casual and too relaxed. So how does it sound? I've heard jokes from pilots who are about to die. And when I listen to them in this room, I don't think that the jokes are that funny. Now here was a crash, a CFIT crash that happened uh, several years ago. And uh, the pilots basically flew a Jetstream 31 into the ground on a night uh, while conducting a non-precision approach. Now it was a jet stream. Now you know there's not a hard petition between the cockpit and the passenger cabin. This was an airline flight and the passengers were in the back and they were laughing, they're going home, you know, they were jovial, they were laughing. And so the pilots made this comment to themselves, you know, they're going to act like they're going to open up the, the curtain and say to the passengers, you know, I think you're going to need to shut the blank up. Now, I don't know what that hashtag means when I say shut the blank up, but I can imagine what that word would have been. You know, I would love to just poke my head around and say, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've thought about it. <laughs> it's unanimous up here. We've come to the conclusion that you should all shut the blank up. I'm sure they thought it was funny as all daylights. And a few seconds later, they crashed that jet stream into the ground and killed just about everyone on board, including themselves. Now, I once met the sister-in-law of the captain of this flight, and I was talking about this flight, and she said, you know, he was a great guy. 
We all loved him. But this, this is what he's going to be remembered for. Not what a great guy that he was. This is a Learjet that crashed going into New York a few years ago. You can see actually a security camera video still frame just at the moment that this airplane is crashing into the ground. It was just two pilots on board. I'm sorry they lost their lives. The flight itself was only about 27 minutes just from Philadelphia to New York. And in 27 minutes, I think there were over 130 cuss words, very obscene words heard on that cockpit voice recorder. Now, I'll admit, I don't always use language, unfortunately, that my mother would be proud of, but to have 130 obscene words in a 28 minute flight. So he says, you see the hashtags here, much something better. You know, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. You can see here in one sentence, he says a, an obscene word, one, two, three, four times in one sentence. So how does it sound? It doesn't sound real good. So how do we predict a, a, a future of safety culture? What is safety culture? This is a crash that we investigated, a helicopter, an air ambulance flight. It happened two years ago, and what we determined when we ruled on this accident was survival flight. The company's poor safety culture likely influenced the accident pilot's decision to conduct the accident flight. So what is? Here's another one. This was another search and rescue flight a few years ago, and we said contributed to the accident was an organizational culture that prioritized mission execution over aviation safety prioritized mission safety mission execution over aviation safety so what is safety culture it's a term that we hear a lot what is it here's a term from the u.s nuclear regulatory commission and i i like this term it says safety culture is the core values and behaviors resulting from a collective commitment by leaders and individuals to emphasize safety over competing goals to ensure the, the protection of people and the environment. It's a collective commitment, not just by the pilots, not just by the mechanics, not just by the union employees, not just by management. It's a commitment by everybody in the organization that they share that commitment to safety, and another thing, that they emphasize safety over competing goals. Now, I realize that there's competing goals. I lived with that for many years as an airline pilot. On-time performance was important to the airline. Passenger service was important to us. We wanted good customer service. All of these things are important, but safety has to always have a, a seat at the table to ensure that safety is emphasized over those competing goals. So I'm going to ask you early in the morning in Malaysia, do you have a good safety culture? Think about that just for a second. Do you have a good safety culture? I hope you do, but the renowned professor, Dr. James Reason, and I know that if you've been to safety conferences, you always see the reason model, the Swiss cheese model. Dr. Reason has written and written and written about organizational accidents. And he says, it's worth pointing out that if you're convinced that your organization has a good safety culture, you are almost certainly mistaken. And he goes on to say that a safety culture is something that is striving for, but rarely a turn attained. And it's the process it's the process that's more important than the product. So what do you think he's saying? Well, I think he's saying that, yes, we hope you have a good safety culture. But first of all, it's never something that you, it's not a either you're there or you're not. It's a journey. It's something that you're constantly striving for. 
each and every day. And, and so it's the process, the fact that you're striving for it each day that is more important than getting there because there is no there. Once you think you're there, you get complacent. A good friend of mine, in fact, I talked to him today, Dr. Jim Schultz, or um, um, good friend Jim Schultz. Jim has written a book on safety culture, and uh, uh, he was an F-4 pilot in the Air Force. Um, and he's written, like I say, a couple of books on safety and safety culture. And Jim says that good can be bad. With good safety performance, people and organizations can easily become complacent. Don't ever believe that a lack of accidents means that you are safe. Because to, to counter the complacency, there must be a leadership obsession with continuous improvement. After I left the airline in 2004, I ran a, a Fortune 500 flight department for two years before joining the NTSB. And I would wake up sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning in just a cold sweat because I was thinking about something. Oh my gosh, I can't let that happen in our organization. And that's the, the, the leadership obsession that we're talking about. We don't want people to ever get too, too, too uh, comfortable. So in the next few minutes, let me just leave you with perhaps a few tips to avoid something that looks like this. Take the words NTSB for National Transportation Safety Board, and each of those letters stands for something. The N stands for negative publicity avoidance. The pilot who crashed this DC-9 a few years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina, he was an F-16 pilot, had all types of air medals, but he made a mistake. We all make mistakes. And his point was, he said, you never know on which flight your career will be judged. It's like the pilot I mentioned flying the jet stream. He was a great guy, known as a great pilot, but how do people remember him? They remember him for the crash that he was in because he was goofing off, laughing about the passengers, and not paying attention. This one here, yes, they made mistakes. They encountered wind shear. But, but this pilot's comment, and he, he survived, 37 passengers died. You never know on which flight your career will be judged. Some people say you're only as good as your last flight. Well, that may be true, but I always looked at it this way. You're only as good as your next flight. So keep that in mind. Do you want your name on the front page of the paper? Warning, pilot error. Pilot's act may have led to the crash. I always tried to think about this. If you were in a crash, how, or if I was in a crash, how would the NTSB look at it? What would they say? How would your friends, what would they think? This picture happens to be taken. Many of you have probably been there, the Raffles Bar in Singapore. Um, my cousin here lives in Singapore, and yes, we were doing what friends do when they get together. I was not flying the next day. And, uh, but what would your friends say if you were to be in an accident? What would your neighbor say if that quiet little street that you lived on looked like this with satellite trucks camped outside? And most importantly, most importantly, What would your family think? I always tried to think about that, knowing that there was a cockpit voice recorder listening to everything that I said. I always thought about that because I didn't want my wife and my daughter listening or hearing or reading about how unprofessional I was. The T stands for take the most conservative approach. You know, when you've got to make a decision, I was a young captain. I made captain with a major airline at 27 years old. The good news is I was a young captain. The bad news was I was a young captain. I didn't have a whole lot of experience. 
before I sat in the left seat. I spent the first year or two of my career with the airline as a flight engineer, and then about 600 hours in the right seat of a Boeing 727, and now all of a sudden, I'm the one with the four stripes. But one thing that helped me through was this right here. If I've got to make a decision, take the most conservative approach. Should I de-ice or don't de-ice? I've heard people say, oh, it's just a little bit of ice. I'm thinking, yeah, but people crash because of a little bit of ice on the wings. If you've got to divide, decide, should I divert or should I continue? Or should I add more fuel or should I risk a min fuel landing? When you're faced with the decision, just take the conservative approach. It will usually keep you out of the sticks. And the S, it stands for SOP adherence, adhering to standard operating procedures. When I was at the Flight Safety Foundation Conference in 1993 in Kuala Lumpur, Earl Weiner, who was at Boeing at the time, he later became an NTSB board member and served honorably with me on the board until about two years ago. But Earl Weiner from Boeing and his team presented this paper, which I thought was excellent. Granted, this is a, a study that was done in 1993, but it makes a lot of sense. Boeing studied 138 accidents over a 10-year period that claimed almost 5,700 lives. And for each of those accidents, they said, what could have prevented this crash? And I want you to see what is the top factor, the top accident prevention strategy the pilot flying adherence to procedures. Almost half of those crashes could have been prevented if the pilot flying had adhered to procedures. And the top, and the, and the third top factor, accident prevention strategy, was to have the pilot not flying, the pilot monitoring adhering to procedures. Now, another way of looking at that is, is that once you start deviating from procedures, you're more predictable, you're predicted to have an accident. Look at it this way. What we found from line operation safety audit data. Now, this is where you put a trained observer on the cockpit, on the cockpit jump seat, and go out and observe. And by looking over thousands and thousands of flights, the LOSA data revealed that compared to crews who followed SOPs, the crew members who intentionally deviated from procedures, they averaged making three times more errors, they mismanaged more errors, and they found themselves in more bad situations in the airplane, like runway incursions or unstabilized approaches or altitude deviations. So let's think about this. The crews who intentionally deviated from SOPs average making three times more errors than those crews who did not intentionally deviate from, er from, from the SOPs. And the mismanagement of errors, hey, I, I make plenty of mistakes and have made plenty of mistakes. But it's how we manage those errors that, that, that count. If I'm about to bust my altitude because I'm climbing to, to, at too high of a rate of climb, and I'm about to go through that assigned altitude, but the guy sitting next to me, the guy or the woman sitting next to me says, hey, Robert, wait a minute. You've got to level off here at 10,000 feet. That's what counts. We're all going to make mistakes. So it's how we manage those errors that matters. Follow SOPs. It will help keep you out of trouble. And finally, the B in NTSB stands for be professional. What is a professional? Well, in my mind, I, I found an article just two weeks ago. We're cleaning up the house, and I found an article that I wrote in 1976 about professionalism. And what is a professional? It's a mindset. It's, it's how you think about things. It's a precise checklist usage, precise call-outs, precise compliance with the SOPs and regulations, staying abreast with the current knowledge and skills, keeping in the books so you can stay current, 
And the ability or the willingness to say, I don't know, or I'm wrong, because you want to encourage the person next to you to be able to give you information that he or she may not otherwise give you. So professionalism is just simply doing the right things, even when no one is watching. So think about that. NTSB, this will help keep you out of trouble. Negative publicity avoidance. Take the most conservative approach. SOPs, follow them and be a professional. So here's a free lesson from a crash. I went to this crash. It was a UPS freighter going in um, uh, early in the morning. They crashed. You can see the runway out there. Both pilots, unfortunately, lost their lives. And here's a very profound statement. Learn from the mistakes of others. You won't live long enough to make them all yourself. So with that, I bid you safe flying, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Remember, what is your attitude? Is it professional? And are you striving every day to maintain a safety culture? So with that, I'm going to quit sharing my screen, and uh, I believe we may have just a few minutes for a few questions. Thank you to the Honorable Chairman Robert Sommel of the NTSB for this enlightening session live from Washington, D.C. We will take a minute to field some questions to the audience. So if there are any questions, now is your time to submit them via the chat box. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we'll now invite back Chairman Robert Sommel to address uh, some of the questions that we have. The floor is yours, sir. Well, the, the participants, uh, the first question is, does the NTSB have any program in place for improving professionalism among people in the industry? We at the NTSB are really an accident investigation agency. So our role is to investigate and then issue safety recommendations for how to improve those problems. Um, we have made numerous recommendations and we've held a forum um, on professionalism. And it's really up to now, it's now up to the FAA and the industry to move forward with our recommendations. So I think it is hopefully through venues like we have here where we can get the word out and tell people about the horrendous things that we're seeing uh, through crashes that might help. But we ourselves are not directly involved in, in, in implementing the solution. It's up to our recommendation recipients to actually move forward on those. Now, here's another great question. How do you see the impact of SMS in ensuring professionalism? As we know, safety management systems, there are several components of that, one of which is you have to have a safety policy. That's important. If you've got the safety policy, which I also think of not just the safety policy, but all of the policies and procedures and guidelines. So first, you've got to have good policies and procedures and guidelines in place. Then you need to make sure that people are following them. So that would be part of the safety assurance component. But the safety risk management, whereby we're looking for risk, I think we're, we're taking our hazards and we're assessing the level of risk associated with those hazards and then putting mitigation strategies in place to mitigate or, or to minimize the chances of that risk uh, having bad consequences. Also through safety assurance, you are doing a couple of things. You are seeing if people are actually following procedures. Some, some airlines, some companies, as you know, have uh, flight data monitoring programs, which I think that if this Gulfstream operator did have a flight data monitoring program, they would have seen that people, the pilots were not following, were not doing the full flight control check before each flight. In fact, ironically, that's how we learned what this carrier, what this operator had been doing. The previous owner of the Gulfstream 
equip the aircraft so that it would be capable of flight data monitoring. So when we found that recorder, we were able to go back and look at all of the previous 174, 175 flights. Unfortunately, that operator, the operator involved in the crash, was not taking advantage of the flight data monitoring program. So I think that those are a couple of ways that a safety management system can help ensure compliance. And in my opinion, there's a, a, there's a direct linkage between compliance and professionalism. And finally, another question. Can you please tell us who in an organization that should take leadership in promoting the safety culture of the organization? And I think there's a little bit more in that if I can scroll down. Is, is it the pilots, the managers, or even up to someone higher? Well, I firmly believe that the safety culture has to, must absolutely start at the top of the organization. I've often said that safety culture starts at the top of an organization and permeates throughout the entire organization. If you don't have people at the top that are fostering, encouraging that safety culture, then you're not going to be very successful with it. So I think that the senior management has to embrace it and then it has to be embraced by everyone else in the organization. So with that, uh, Anthony, I don't think that there are any more questions in the chat. And I think I'm a little bit uh, over time at this point anyway, because I know that Captain Chester Vu, who of course is the CEO of the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia is up next. And I personally can't wait to hear his comments, uh, even though we happen to be, I'll have to put on my pajamas because it's 11 o'clock at night here. But uh, I, I do look forward. It looks like you've got a great lineup for today as well as for tomorrow. And Tom Huff of Gulfstream, of course, he's on the time zone as I am. He'll be presenting basically at uh, two o'clock in the morning. But uh, we, we, he and I are both very passionate about promoting safety. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me.